Hello everyone, this is Tom in Los Angeles. I hope you're doing fine. And uh, I'm here to um, give a little bit of a summary of Canto 13 of Inferno and some comments with uh, the full awareness that um, at the end of this video, there's still gonna be a ton of stuff about this Canto that I haven't even touched on because it's such a rich, intensely packed Canto that I personally love. Um, many scholars love and consider one of the most uh, uh, successful or successfully executed cantos. And so I hope you guys uh, like it too, enjoy it too. In uh, Before beginning the canto, I have a, a general comment or general thought, I would say, at this point, we are at canto 13, and uh, we've seen already a lot of condemned souls. We've seen a lot of uh, sins and people who have been uh, condemned to hell for different reasons. So one of the questions to ask, and I think it's an appropriate question to ask, is how does this make a difference for me? How does this reflect? How is this important for me? Um, for you, reader of the Divine Comedy, for you, reader of the Inferno. And uh, obviously this is very subjective, but I can share in two seconds my own experience. My experience in reading, at least until here, is that um, I, I certainly have seen myself reflected very much in uh, almost everyone, every character that Dante has introduced to us, more or less until the Minotaur, the Minotaur uh, level. Um, that's uh, roughly until just entered the city of this. Uh, so I feel like I have uh, Francesca in me, I have a lot of Chaco in me, I have a lot of the people who are pushing the huge boulders, and uh, even of uh, Philippe Argenti. Whenever I lose my patient, I, patience, I feel like Philippe Argenti. Um, now I feel like uh, probably going forward, given that we're going into deeper into the depths of hell, um, it's going to be um, a less directly um, felt reflection, um, in, at least I think for the average person, okay, who is uh, watching these videos and uh, the average, let's call it normal person, uh, because the more, the deeper we go, the more specifically evil these uh, sins are going to be, and willingly evil. That doesn't mean that we're gonna we're not gonna see a reflection of uh, ideas or thoughts that we actually have had in our past in this uh, more terrible sense. That's my my whole point. Um, at the bottom bottom of hell, there is people who betray their families, that betray their friends, etc. And uh, I don't feel like I've ever betrayed my family, but uh, in looking at these uh, terrible sinners who are there next to Lucifer, there is always something uh, human in them and uh, as such uh, is reflected in, in my nature as well. So at this point we can uh, get started with the canto. As another very brief introduction, um, the, the style of this canto is very peculiar and if you already read it, even in English, you might have picked up on uh, how strange the syntax of the sentences is. Uh, at least strange compared to the rest of what we read so far. Now, in Italian, it's very strange. In Italian, pardon, it's uh, really a very... I feel like, I feel as if Dante has, uh, has set himself to write a canto that would somehow replicate how twisted and quirked and tortuous this... Uh, uh, dry branches of dead trees are very um, intricate and, uh, and and quirky sentences and syntaxes. Now, for two main reasons, though, he did this. Uh, on one hand, to um, slightly imitate the style of uh, Pierre de la Vigne, who is the main character, the protagonist of this canto. He was a jurist, he was a very, very, very high-level politician, and also a poet, also a writer. So Dante, who died 
um, before Dante was uh, was an adult. So Dante had a chance to read his writings, etc., and he was familiar with them. They were particularly uh, complicated from a syntax point of view. The second reason for this particular style, um, and I'm, I'm uh, simply parroting what scholars are saying. Obviously, this is not my own uh, my, my own uh, understanding, but I can see that it makes sense. The second reason is that uh, Dante is also trying to provide a sense of uh, what it feels like spiritually and in uh, in our reason, in our thought, uh, to be um, desolate as desolate and confused as somebody who commits suicide or somebody who is driven by life to the point of contemplating suicide. Because in, in this canto, we are still in the seventh circle, but the second um, round, let's say, of the, of the seventh circle, they are violent against themselves. So mostly we're talking about uh, suicides and that was, that was mostly Dante is referring to, but we also see the spendthrifts in this canto, uh, who in a certain sense commit violence against themselves through um, the material goods. Nessus had not yet reached the other side when we moved forward into woods unmarked by any path. We are uh, surprised to find the woods again when after 13 cantos we haven't seen almost one piece of vegetation in the entire inferno. In fact, the last uh, greenery that we saw was up in Limbo, the beautiful garden where Aristotle was, etc. Since then, it's been all barren and completely dry. Here, uh, the poet tells us that we are entering another woods, another wood. So what's, what's happening and why? Um, as usual, there's many different interpretations, but uh, I think it's pretty clear that um, this type of wood um, is there for a reason and it's uh, there also to remind us of the dark woods of the very first line of the Divine Comedy. Um, because even if it's, uh, it cannot be uh, proven because it's not been documented, but uh, uh, I personally believe that in that moment of uh, complete crisis, existential crisis that Dante went through, he did contemplate suicide as well. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's also pretty clear in the very first uh, uh, sentences of uh, the first canto, where he says, uh, um, "In uh, the death is hardly more bitter than thinking of it now." He did think of death in a potentially suicidal way. So he finds himself in this uh, very similar environment only. We can imagine it as a sea of uh, uh, dry and barren trees with a lot of thorns. And this sea of trees uh, hit me because I knew it was reminding me of something. And then I searched a little bit and I realized that uh, there is a sea of trees. In fact, I believe there was a movie made with this title, Sea of Trees. But this sea of trees is uh, the so-called uh, forest of suicide or suicide forest uh, that's in Japan. Uh, placed a little west of Tokyo that's become uh, famous for uh, negatively famous for uh, um, being the place where many Japanese uh, people decided to take their own life by hanging themselves there or going there and committing and having uh, overdose of drugs. Um, I think in the latest years the authorities took some measures to prevent this from happening but uh, in the, in the past, I know that the numbers were quite high, from 100 people per year, if not more, 100, 150. So, very eerie location, very, very eerie location. Um, made even more creepy and, and eerie by the fact that uh, there is nothing around, there's nobody to be seen. And this is what Dante picks up on immediately. The leaves were not green, the bows not smooth, knotted and crooked forked no fruit, but poison thorns. Of the wild beasts near Cessna, Cecina and Corneto uh, locations in central Italy, the hate fields worked by men with plow and harrow. These beasts are boars. They used to go around these uh, farms. 
non infest thickets that are so, as rough or dense as this. Here, the repellent harpies uh, make their nests, who drove the Trojans from the Strophids with dire announcements of the coming woe. He just refers to an episode in uh, uh, Book 3 of the Aeneid where um, the harpies were flying around and, and not only soiling the Trojans' um, lunches or, and, and meals, but also they were uh, screaming some uh, nefarious prophecies to them, telling them that he, he, about tragedies to come. So harpies are, are still, are still uh, um, present. And uh, he describes them, they have broad wings, a human neck and face, clawed feet and swollen feather bellies. They caught the lamentations in the eerie trees. So that's what Dante can hear, can hear lamentations in the eerie trees, but cannot really see anybody. Uh, here the good master Virgil began, before you go farther, be aware that now you are in this, the second ring, and so you shall be until the horrible sand. Look well, for here one sees things which in words would be incredible. So Dante stops, and uh, he stops bewildered, um, which is something that um, in, in the original um, Italian he says, lost, uh, smarrito, bewildered, lost. What matters, um, I think, is that he's not uh, using adjectives or words uh, indicating fear. He's still not afraid, and as we noticed in the last canto as well, Dante has gained a type of confidence that uh, in the first cantos of Inferno he absolutely didn't have. He was shaking like a leaf every uh, three or four tersines. Uh, here he is lost, he's feeling bewildered, but he's not feeling afraid, so his confidence not only in himself but uh, uh, in Virgil as his own intellect and reason is growing, is, uh, um, is gradually growing. This is a sentence that uh, the, coming, the upcoming sentence is something that really demonstrates what I mentioned before, the fact that in this canto he uses sentences so contorted on purpose to remind us of uh, the contortion and the quirkiness of the of the trees in these woods, and also to remind us of uh, the way that Pierre de la Vigne used to write. Not only Pierre de la Vigne, but uh, all of his court, and uh, more broadly, a lot of jurists and uh, law specialists in those times, always looking for little details and uh, uh, with turns of phrases that sounded really badly, um, sometimes even on purpose. So what he says here is, uh, I believe, my guide believed that in my belief the voices I heard from somewhere in among the grove came somehow from people who were in hiding places. A terrible sentence. In Italian it sounds uh, even, uh, I would say, grotesque because it's credio, che credete, chio credesse, che tante voci uscisser tra quei bronchi. Uh, as usual, it's more concise than even the English, as we've seen, it's uh, so synthetic, but uh, it's, it's really a terrible syntax of a, of a sentence, and uh, comically so, almost. But uh, the, you know, what, uh, what uh, Dante is uh, uh, not saying here in this confusing passage is what he's actually thinking. Uh, I had to take a, a step back when I, when I reread it here. What, what it means, it means what he's saying. He, he thought that he thought, etc. But really, he's not telling us what he's really thinking. Something to highlight. Um, and so Virgil says, if you remove a little branch from any one of these pieces of foliage around us, the thoughts you have will also be broken off. You're going to be um, satisfied with, with your, your thoughts. I reached my hand a little in front of me and twisted off um, a, a little uh, one shoot of a mighty thorn bush, and it moaned. Here is one of the most spectacular uh, visionary inventions of, of Dante. Because yes, he does take this image of the speaking broken branch from Virgil. Uh, Virgil had uh, a very similar 
a fact narrated in, in the innate, uh, whenever he said, uh, I think he's still in book third, I think in the third book, where Aeneas is uh, taking a pause and they're trying to gather some branches to make an offer. And uh, one of these branches, when it's pulled or uh, it, it cries out, and they realize that Polydorus uh, is somebody who had been um, dead for a while, uh, dead, dead because hit by many spears, many javelins, and uh, laying down underground with all these javelins coming out of his uh, uh, chest and, and belly. The, the javelins had taken the shape of, uh, of a plant and uh, his own blood would uh, um, ooze out of, of this. However, there is a huge difference between that image and what Dante is proposing here, because in that case, it was almost uh, 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 an image that was proposed in a positive light. Here, the, it's a completely different thing. Uh, as always, Dante takes freely from uh, classical uh, myths, etc., but uh, reinterprets them and I, like someone, someone of, of you actually said, I believe it was Ross, um, or two title track, I, I don't remember, but in, in, a, in, a, in a way that is uh, con consistently more subtle and uh, maybe even more sophisticated than the actual uh, myths, than how it's narrated in the myths. So we are in front of this uh, exceptional um, vision right now. The, little broken branch starts speaking. Why have you torn me? Have you no pity then? Once we were men, now we are stumps of wood. Your hand should show some mercy, though we had been the souls of serpents. As flames spurt at one side of a green log, oozing sap at the other end, hissing with escaping air, so that branch flowed with words and blood together. Uh, I love this simile because it's so perfect. Uh, you can see it and uh, you can really see the green piece of wood when you put it in the fire because there is so much humidity inside. On the other end of the piece of wood, you're going to see this uh, almost sputtering. It's going to spit out some, uh, some smoke and some water or drops of water. And this is, in this example, the, uh, what's happening to the blood uh, of, of this soul. Um, the, condemned soul having turned into a tree and uh, the, the, the image um, tells us that they are free to speak only when uh, one of the branches or, the, or their leaves is broken out. Uh, in, uh, in a few words, the punishment consists in being turned into a tree because you have been ungrateful and disrespectful of your body during the life. So you're not uh, gonna have a body in the afterlife, but you're gonna be a tree. And uh, the, the pain that you feel inside will, able to be, will be able to be expressed only when the harpies who fly around uh, tore away a little leaf or a little branch here and there. And so your blood will come out. It's one of the creepiest images of, of the entire inferno probably. Release the tip and I stood like one in dread. Again, technically, we can see that Dante is not afraid. Uh, he doesn't say that he feels fear, but he stands like somebody who is in fear. Um, had he been able to credit or comprehend before or with the spirit, my sage replied, what he witnessed only in my verses. It's, uh, as usual, uh, Virgil, a little bit uh, scolding of Dante for in his confusion in, in finding himself in these woods again, he actually forgot um, that, uh, that Virgil had already written about a similar image in, the, in, in his works. And so Virgil scolds him. Um, but uh, here it's a way for Virgil to, uh, let's say, apollo or justify the fact that he asked Dante to do what he did, which hurt the soul. And uh, he proposes that uh, Dante makes amends by freshening your fame, this soul's fame, when he returns again to the world above, as, as is permitted. 
and the broken stem spoke. Your words have so much sweetness, they contrive to draw me out of silence. I am enticed to talk a little while, may it not prove burdensome to you. I am he who possessed both keys to Frederick's, Frederick's heart, and I turned either, unlocking and locking, with so soft a twist, I kept his secrets from almost any other. We are hearing the voice of uh, Pierre de Lavigne. He was the first uh, chancellor, let's say the highest uh, assistant, uh, political assistant of Frederick II. We heard the name of Frederick II already uh, in the, where we saw the um, heretics, in the same uh, tomb where the Epicureans were. And here he's mentioned again um, as uh, the emperor, Pierre de Lavigne, was um, assisting as, uh, as his most trusted advisor. And in order to explain this trust, um, Pierre de Lavigne uses a biblical reference saying that he was the one to have the key that could lock and unlock um, the, uh, his, his, uh, his heart. Basically, having the, the, the keys to the yes and no of Frederick. And uh, there is also a reference to the fact that Piero de Levigne, his name is Piero, and Piero uh, is really close to Pietro, which is St. Peter, St. Peter in heaven with the keys. There is so much stuff that we, I'm sure, are missing from, from this canto, but let's just move on. Um, I stayed so true to this, to my glorious office, that I lost both sleep and life. I, uh, I have to make a comment here. This is another perfect example of how Dante is much more clear and even easier in the English translation than in Italian for modern Italian. Because in Italian he says, tanto chi ne perde li sonni e polsi, which literally is translated in I lost my slumbers and wrists. So, yes, if you think about it for a second, you realize that wrists, especially for the medical doctrine of the time, meant that uh, vital energy was in your wrists. And so if you're losing your wrists, it means that you're dying. But uh, it's not as immediately understandable. While in English, it says, I lost my life. And I believe Another translator, uh, Robin Kirkpatrick, uses the expression, I wasted sleep and lost my steady pulse, which might be a little bit more elegant, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, the fact that uh, the word pulse is used and it, it, it does have a, a sound that re recalls palsy, uh, I see it as a positive idea, a good idea. Um, the harlot that never takes its whore's eyes from Caesar's retinue is referring to envy here, uh, in the sense of courtesan envy. In a couple of words, the story goes that uh, the story is that uh, Piero de Levigne was for many years the most trusted advisor of Frederick II, uh, very talented um, in uh, rhetorical arts, in uh, uh, jurisprudence in, uh, in law, in, in a very smart person all around, and also in, in writing. And uh, at a certain point, in the constant, uh, terrible um, balance of power and, and battle between Frederick II and the Church, we need to remember that Frederick II uh, was called the Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichristo. So um, at a certain point, in his version, Piero de la Vigna says in this uh, Divine Comedy version, says that he was um, unjustly accused of something, of betraying the emperor. And, uh, the, and the fact, the historical fact that he was accused of betraying the emperor, the emperor. And uh, he was uh, uh, made blind, he was blinded by the emperor, the emperor ordered him to be blinded and thrown into jail, where out of desperation, he committed suicide, apparently by knocking his head uh, very violently against the wall. That's the story. Uh, there are a little bit of uh, um, discrepancies or 
debate. There is a debate mm, on whether these accusations against Pierre de la Vigne were true or not, were founded or not. But Dante, and this is what matters, uh, strongly takes uh, Pierre's side. In fact, Pierre has been uh, identified as uh, uh, almost an alter ego of Dante in this canto. Why? Because just like Dante, he was somebody who had covered political uh, high roles and uh, unjustly, in, I, in Dante's eyes, unjustly uh, accused. So he really sees himself himself into, into Pierre. And so at this point, we can also ask another question. We can ask why, um, just like we've seen many times before, Dante is taking the side, seems to be taking the side of the condemned soul. Um, why is he putting them in hell um, as sinners, as, as the damned, uh, but at the same time, almost as a contrast, as in conflict with this, um, feels uh, close to them and to the point of feeling pity for some of them, not all of them, because Filippo Argento, Argenti was a different story, but Francesca, etc. In this case, he, is, he actually expressly says that he's going to feel, he feels so much pity for Pierre de la Vigne that he is uh, uh, not even able to address his question directly to him. And he asks Virgil to ask his question. He says, um, please ask what you discern. Um, I cannot because of pity that fills my heart. So um, I believe there is a really good um, comment by Mark Musa on this uh, pity that the pilgrim, the pilgrim is feeling here. Dante feels pity for Pierre because of the false accusation that precipitated his fall from favor, not because of the punishment uh, meted out to his, to his shade for having taken his own life. It's a completely different kind of, of pity from that which Dante felt for Francesca or Chaco. Even Pierre himself recognized the justice of his punishment because of, the, of his suicide uh, and the, and the sin sinfulness of it. So there is an identification between Dante and Pierre. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful the way that after Virgil formulates the question to Pierre, to the tree, uh, in such an anthropomorphic way, the tree puffs out uh, to express almost uh, the effort that he needs to make to answer that question. The, the, and again, like as always with Dante, it's very short little images. He says, he puffed air hard as soon as that exhalation became a voice. Pierre de Levigne here describes the technicalities of how the condemned soul goes from uh, meeting Minos uh, upstairs in, uh, in hell to becoming a tree. And uh, it simply is, a, is thrown there, randomly uh, taking seed in this uh, deserted woods, dry woods, and then it becomes a, a tree. And the pain comes from the action of the harpies, like, like we said. There is here another uh, really perfect, really, really perfect example of uh, uh, how the Italian is a little harder to understand than the English, where um, Pinsky, in this case, says, the harpies feeding on the foliage create pain and an outlet for the pain as well. It's well expressed and it's clear that uh, um, the, the harpies create this outlet for the pain. What, the way Dante says this, um, it's not straightforward to understand at all. Um, literally, he says, the harpies eating these leaves make pain and also a window to the pain. So we need to understand from this uh, Italian, fanno uh, dolore and al dolor finestra, we need to understand the meaning, which is they open this window to the condemned soul's pain, uh, being an outlet and allowing them to express it. But there is a, an additional layer of, uh, of thinking that needs to go into deciphering this. That's, uh, that's why Dante generally makes, you, makes your head um, smoke from your ears. Um, and here we are at the end of uh, Pierre's uh, uh, appearance, in a sense. 
um, as uh, his answer is completed. We both were still attentive when he was done, thinking he might have more to say to us when an uproar surprised us. Very theatrical change of scene. Uh, just as when a hunter, mindful of wild boar and the chase, uh, two people, two guys, come through at a desperate pace, naked, torn, so hard pressed they seem to crash headlong through every tangle. They are running and they're crying, they're screaming, and one of them is screaming, uh, Come now, come now, come in a rush, or oh death. He's referring to the second death, of course, because they are in hell, but they are um, in, in tremendous pain and fear. Um, these guys are the spendthrift. Uh, it's uh, important to distinguish them from uh, the profligates that we saw upstairs in hell uh, who were pushing the, the, the huge boulders against the, the greedy. And uh, the, really the difference is simply in the fact that the spendthrift here um, are committing an actual violence against themselves in uh, willfully being spent with and, and taking the conscious decision of uh, destroying themselves by destroying the, the very things that are necessary for their survival, their assets, their uh, goods, their wealth. So this, uh, um, this is a very uh, actionful scene. And this Jacopo de Sant'Andrea was one of the spendthrift was uh, uh, famous in Dante's, uh, there was a story around Dante's times that he so uh, dissipated and destroyed his own wealth that he had inherited that, for example, he invited people for dinner uh, in the evening and uh, to make sure that his guests would find a way and see the road in the darkness of the, of the evening, he would uh, notoriously uh, set to flame, set to fire, a lot of houses of his own property, probably, uh, to make light and to lighten up the way, the road. It's one example of what this guy was uh, was doing. And finally, we get to this uh, anonymous anonymous um, Florentine suicide, who is uh, uh, he has taken the shape of a bush and he's been uh, broken by Jacopo de Sant'Andrea. Uh, his branches have been broken. Virgil asks, uh, who were you who through so many wounds exhaled his blood mixed with sad words? And uh, the bush answered, O souls, you two who arrived to see this shameful havoc crush my leaves and tear them for me. Gather them now and bring them to the foot of this wretched bush. In life, I was of the city that chose to leave Mars, her first patron, and take the Baptist, for which the art of Mars will always make her grieve. He says, I, in life, was from Florence. I'm from Florence. Uh, the city, they used to have Mars as a patron of, of the city. And then with Const Constantine, with the arrival of uh, Christianity, changed patron to John the Baptist. This change, though, has a, a strong significance for Dante. As we know, Dante is always very critical of Florence, especially for Florence as the Wall Street of his days, as the city of bankers, the city of uh, um, greed, and uh, not as a coincidence, on the flip side of the, the Fiorino, the golden Fiorino, the, the coin, was in fact the head of John the Baptist. So uh, it makes a lot of sense that um, this uh, Florentine says, the art of Mars will always make her grieve. There is almost a part of uh, the god Mars who is still taking revenge uh, on Florence because of this change, because of ab they abandoned him and they took on John the Baptist. And, uh, and later, when they pitched the city again over the ashes left by Attila, they rebuilt Florence after the destruction of Attila, those striving to refound it would have worked in vain. And I... I made my own house to be my gallows. I made uh, this, uh, I basically uh, hanged myself inside my own house. We don't know exactly who this person uh, was. He remains anonymous. And the fact that Dante lives in 
anonymous, in my opinion, makes it even more disturbing and adds to the horrific uh, atmosphere of the entire canto. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please let me know what you thought about this canto. Did you also love it like uh, I did? Did you not love it? Did you find something that you, you particularly you didn't like or, uh, or found uh, that didn't really resonate with you? Did it make you think about uh, the decision of uh, suicide? In fact, suicide in itself, uh, before Christianity, in general, had a very different uh, social meaning or social value. In, in, in some cases, suicide was even seen with uh, great honor. Uh, with Christianity, it became a sin against uh, the God-given body, etc., etc. If you have any thoughts, I would love to hear your, your opinions. And uh, thank you again for watching.